A lot of people that follow this channel or stumble upon this channel are surprised at some of the positions I take. They think that they're incompatible. Leftists uh, may like to hear some of the anti-capitalist stuff, but they're very surprised that someone could hold anti-capitalist uh, radical opinions and not believe in radical social liberalism and internationalism. And a lot of nationalists uh, hear discussions around socialism or anti-capitalism or some of this stuff and they think it sounds very radical that it should put me in the same camp as communists and they have firmly uh, entrenched nationalist beliefs with a kind of reactionary conservatism in their mind. So I wanted to talk about the basis for my nationalism and what I see as the moral narrative that underlies nationalism, what the basis of the nationalist struggle should be today, what it is that we're struggling against, and what our narrative should be if we are to moralise people and win people over to our side. Now when it comes to how I frame nationalism, first of all, to start from first principles, I am a traditionalist, a, a radical traditionalist in the sense of someone like Genon or Julius Evola. Now, Traditionalism has been bastardised, like many labels, by liberalism, specifically by liberal conservatism, uh, where, you know, it's taken to mean worshipping some specific point in the past, uh, wanting to preserve exactly some time period within liberalism, whether it's the, the 1950s or the early 20th century or whatever else. But for me, traditionalism is not about worshipping the past. It's about recognising the eternal presence of eternal truths. These truths manifest differently in different times and places through culture and religion and local customs. And the manifestation that it takes is natural law. And here I already run into disagreements with other nationalists. Because a mistake that many nationalists make is they believe that a recognition of universal truth necessitates universalism. In other words, if we recognise universal truths, which is another name for objective truth, then they say we'd have to commit to some kind of universalism in the social world where everyone has equal value, hierarchy doesn't exist, uh, discrimination is impossible. But to me this is a contradiction. It's the recognition of universal standards that make hierarchy possible to begin with. And universal truth can manifest in diversity and take heterogeneous forms. It's materialism and relativism, I believe, that has led to the nihilistic drive to equalise the world, not a recognition of universal truth. And it's this desire that not only forces the equalisation of everyone but also the destruction of national and cultural distinctions. Because if nothing exists except matter and flux, then we are nothing but biological machines. Our behaviour means nothing beyond a mechanical reaction to outside stimuli. And then the tendency is towards the rule of technics. If materialism is true, then all that we're left with is technics. Biological and cultural diversity Religious and ethnic traditions have no value in this worldview. Nature becomes something to be conquered and exploited because the idea of a natural law or harmonious living with nature is also a fiction. And this is what it means to say that capitalism and communism are both materialist doctrines. The communist utopian vision imagines a global society in which we're totally free of natural constraints. The capitalist envisions a global marketplace of individuals partaking in the endless technological progress of ever-increasing standards of living, which they equate with a rise in our ability to purchase consumer goods and extricate ourselves from nature. In neither of these doctrines there is a recognition of anything beyond the individual, anything eternal, anything natural. The right and the left wing on a liberal compass are both advancing to an ideal of a transhumanist utopia in which people are born free of natural constraints and in which identity is something to be chosen. The capitalist sees identities other than consumer identities as barriers to commodification. The 
capitalist wants you to have no identity beyond the transient one you purchase. The communist sees identities other than class consciousness as illusory and only wishes to use class consciousness as a means to a utopia devoid of class distinctions, a utopia devoid of all identity. The left and the right are both waging a war against identity, against the qualitative in favour of the quantitative good of blind material progress. Now there's much divergence among nationalists about what exactly is the nature of the nationalist struggle today, what exactly we're struggling against, and what the moral basis of that struggle is, if there is one at all. I've spent a lot of time pushing back against the idea that nationalists are people that want to rule over others, that they're masking their colonial desires in the guise of nationalism, or that nationalists are just uh, racist reactionaries who are firmly wedded to capitalism. But the fact is that for many that is the case. And again, that's why I want to make it clear how I conceive of nationalism today as social nationalism, as an anti-capitalist, anti-colonial movement that is the true basis for a genuine opposition to neoliberalism. Now, depending on who you ask, uh, you'll be told that the elimination of national distinctions, the move to globalism is anything from an elite Masonic project that's been orchestrated over centuries to a communist plot to bring in global communism. And this isn't, again, really something that I subscribe to as much. There's elements of truth in all of the, the narratives out there. But to me, fundamentally, what we're battling against is the inexorable progress of capital. It is capitalism. And again, we get into the weeds here of distinctions where for some people, capitalism is just the free exchange of goods. It's just markets. Now, no nationalist is against markets, and I'm certainly not. In fact, I'd like to have genuine free markets. The kind of social nationalism I envision would be a distributism, where instead of land being a commodity to be bought and sold and speculated on, that everyone would have land, everyone would have a dwelling, uh, that there would be genuine free exchange between people within the nation. But capitalism as an ism is where capital dominates. It is a process of metabolism where the earth and natural resources are metabolized to be turned into money. And this money is in the perpetual pursuit of more money. And this is all fueled by debt. Now, there's a number of reasons why I believe capitalism can basically be equated with endless growth. Capitalism is endless growth as an economic system. And we've had perpetual compound growth of about 3 to 4% a year since the inception of capitalism. Capitalism is investorism. The economy is fueled by investors. They invest in stocks, uh, not for the production of any particular goods, but for a return on their investment, and that means growth. The tendency to growth is built into every company, every corporation in capitalism. It's what investors expect. It's the duty of CEOs to provide growth more than anything else. Capitalism functions on the coercive law of competition. If you don't grow, you'll be wiped out by someone that does. And now this has obviously brought tremendous prosperity to the world, like never before seen, and this is what the apologists for capitalism will always talk about. But this process entails a number of things that make it undesirable and unsustainable. And the first is obviously the ecological limitations that we're now running into with a planet of over 7 billion people approaching up to 11 billion by the middle of the century, if projections are correct. And we are running into deep ecological crisis. There is mass species extinction. There is irreversible damage being done to the natural world. But in the human realm, we're also seeing the destruction of tradition, the destruction of culture, uh, the destruction of indigenous peoples. And this is all really the result of the growth imperative of capitalism and commodification 
is also something that is fundamentally incompatible with the preservation of natural or traditional or folkish ways of living. Capitalism entails commodification. Things have to be turned from the qualitative to the quantitative. Capitalism is in this perpetual state of commodification, or maybe we'll call it quantification. Everything has to be quantified. But the problem with that is there are qualitative truths to life, there are qualitative realities, which have much more value than the quantitative, but which capitalism and which the technological society cannot take account of. All that exists for the materialist is the quantitative. And so what we witness when we talk about cultural Marxism or when we talk about uh, woke leftism, this is really, to me, the process of quantification. It's the process of commodification because traditionalism is a barrier to commodification. It's a lot harder to sell pornography to get people using an OnlyFans if the society you're trying to sell it to is religious. It's a lot harder to have people so alienated that they turn to filling the feeling of a a void in their life with consumer products if they have strong families, if they have strong communities, if they're part of a nation. So these things, the feeling of uh, ethnic kinship, strong families, faith, these are things that are barriers to commodification. And so it is just a inevitability that capitalists and capitalism will come into conflict with these and will inevitably have to break down these inborn identities to leave people identityless consumers that have to then purchase transient consumer identities in the marketplace. And this basically, I believe, is the process that we're witnessing and what it is that we are fighting against. And this is why I believe that nationalism is the genuine anti-capitalism today. Because the left, the communist or anarchist left, share an ontology with the capitalists. They share their materialism, they share their disdain for inborn identities, for faith, for family, for folk, these things that should be the bedrock of the struggle against capitalism. And so the left are serving as the battering rams of the international capitalists against these things that are the natural barriers to the capitalist commodification process. If you read any of the literature, the academic literature on nationalism, it always tends to equate nationalism with the state. And so it sees nationalism as something that elites use for their benefit. And that's often the case. But... It often ignores the anti-colonial nationalism, places like Scotland and Ireland, places where nationalism was in opposition to the regime, like Ukraine uh, against the Russian Empire. Because this presents a, a challenge to the liberal understanding of things. Nationalism isn't something that's constructed as a kind of false consciousness, but it is something that's primordial and that often pre-exists the state. And we have plenty of examples of ancient nationalisms that pre-existed the modern Westphalian notion of the state. And just as the anti-colonial nationalisms of the 20th century were in opposition to the imperialism of the 20th century of something like the British Empire, I believe again that a a folkish anti-colonial nationalism can serve as the basis for a genuine opposition to and resistance against neoliberal, neo-colonial capitalism. And this is where the conception of neo-colonialism comes in. Now, colonialism to me is the exploitation of a subject people by a colonial power. And I would define neo-colonialism this is kind of my own definition, where colonialism changes from coercion to consent. The means of colonialism today isn't the musket, uh, but it's the dildo. The LGBT parades in Japan, the Black Lives Matter marches in Western Europe, this is the form that colonialism takes today. This is neocolonialism. It's no longer administered through the barrel of a gun, but through this kind of manufactured consent 
true liberalism. And this is the entire purpose of liberalism. It is the superstructure of capitalism. And woke liberalism and the uh, racially diverse multicultural liberalism, this is the superstructure of neocolonialism. And just as notions of white superiority were beneficial when colonialism was pushed by the merchant elites, because things like a pride in God and country, things like the desire to spread the Christian faith, uh, the desire to spread uh, a person's race and empire across the world, was the basis for the spread of colonialism that benefited mostly uh, merchant elites. Now that has changed where the flood of population is going in the opposite direction, and so that kind of superstructure is no longer beneficial. And so white supremacy has switched to white saviorism. And so when the conservatives make the critique of leftists that leftists are the real white supremacists, it might sound goofy, but it's not entirely wrong. Because white saviorism now is the basis on which neocolonialism is carried out. Uh, people attend whiteness studies and they you know, check their white privilege and they go to BLM marches and they signal and they, uh, they achieve social capital by being in favour of mass migration and multiculturalism. Uh, but what they're doing is they're facilitating the new neocolonialism in which the working class of native European nations are displaced and further exploited and undercut through the mass importation of foreign workers. So while white supremacy was the basis for colonialism, white saviorism is the basis for neocolonialism. It's the switch from coercion against native populations carried out by uh, colonial powers to consent through propaganda and through social liberalism. And this is how the financial empire spreads itself today. America is the seat of global financial empire and it works to spread liberalism around the world. And this is the form that neocolonialism takes. And this is where the divergence with many other nationalists comes in. Because many nationalists want to defend colonialism. Uh, they want to reject the moral case for our nationalism today. And they want to go back to justifying white imperialism and making arguments for a system that the elite has long since moved on from. Basically, they're missing the shot as far as I'm concerned. Because they're tying their conception of things to a specific political and economic arrangement that existed under very specific conditions in, say, the 17th, 18th, 19th century that no longer exists now. And so there isn't that impetus from the ruling class uh, to support the conditions for hegemony of these ideas. And so they're inevitably fighting a losing game and they inevitably, inevitably play into the enemy's hands where nationalists can be portrayed as supremacists, which therefore... Uh, gives further social capital and gives a stronger moral framing to people that promote white saviorism, to the liberals that can feel good about themselves for opposing the white supremacists while engaging in creating the conditions for neocolonialism themselves. So this is why I believe it's important that we frame our struggle as anti-capitalist and I think that we have made a great mistake, oftentimes nationalists generally, in presenting nationalism as a reactionary conservative ideology rather than as a revolutionary socialist ideology. And this is why I felt compelled to push back against the people that promote a very uh, Nietzschean might is right approach to our struggle. Because the only strength that we have right now, we have no institutions, we have no media, we have no uh, great elite donors, 
Uh, we have no elite faction anywhere to speak of. And yet we do attract people, we win people over. And we win them over because we have truth on our side and we have a compelling moral narrative. And it's just obvious that if you're fighting a kind of ideological battle, that you play to your strengths, that you force the enemy to fight where they're weak. And where the ruling class is weak is on the plane of moral argument, on the fact that the system that they're promoting is depraved, that it is destroying these qualitatively good things. They're promoting a system that is fundamentally anti-human. And so if we're talking about our desire to rule over other people, or if we're talking about the uh, spook that is morality or a moral narrative, and saying that, you know, if we had power, we would basically do whatever is in our interest, regardless of the costs, and that we would wage war against other people, and that we don't make any moral judgment of anyone, including the people in charge now, that everything is relative. If we take this kind of framing, then we really have nothing to oppose the establishment with. And it's not even practical. This is the paradox of absolute pragmatism, is pragmatism isn't very pragmatic. Because people that believe that, people that believe that there is no moral case for nationalism, that life is just a struggle of power and that whoever wins deserves to win in virtue of them winning. That's not moralizing for people. You might look back and say that, well, you know, were the Romans motivated by moral arguments when they were conquering and subjugating subject people? And of course, there's a point to be made there. But we are a tiny distant movement in which people have to make great personal sacrifices. Uh, for what? To make a change in the world that they consider to be good, to make the world a, a better place, to fight for what they consider to be natural, to be the truth, uh, to be a, a better society. And so maybe it's it's better to compare our struggle to something like the early Christians where they triumphed because they had such a powerful moral narrative that they were willing to die in the hundreds for their beliefs, to suffer martyrdom for their beliefs. And this kind of struggle may well come down not to who can uh, inflict the most damage, but to who can suffer the most pain. And it is only a, a powerful moral narrative that is going to present that. And if there's one thing that you can observe from our people specifically, it is uh, how much they can be motivated by a powerful moral narrative. I mean, if you look at something like Black Lives Matter, to an extent, those people are motivated by acquiring social capital. Uh, it is just status signaling. But there are people that are fanatics for this stuff, that are willing to do uh, terrible and dangerous, dangerous things for this stuff because they believe that they have... Uh, the powerful moral narrative on their side. And if we shirk that responsibility of, of providing a, a coherent moral framing for our position, uh, we're shooting ourselves in the foot. Because again, we're giving up in the area where I believe that we're the strongest. So while, you know, for any nationalist, uh, their struggle is always going to be first and foremost for their own people and the struggle right now, to a large extent, is uh, showing people that it is okay to take their own side and to reject this uh, this brainwashing that's been done on them for so long. There is a, a moral frame into our struggle that is universal and that places us outside of the accepted categories provided by the system. You know, all these discussions were sparked earlier in the year over the issue of Palestine when a lot of people uh, pushed back against me for saying that our struggle was similar to the Palestinians and that we should take a, a moral stance and side with the Palestinians and the common objections were one that we should just take our own side and uh, that there is no universal moral basis for it and so we shouldn't concern ourselves with other national struggles or two that 
we'll never convince the elites to go easy on us or side with us by showing them that they're immoral. And both of these things can be true, I don't dispute that. But the point is that to expose the moral bankruptcy of the people ruling over us is not to win them over, to get them to go easy on us, but to moralise and energise our own people. And to show the universal struggle that is going on against capitalism, against colonialism, against the supremacist, the genuinely supremacist ideology of Zionism, to show that this is a universal struggle being carried out by disparate peoples across the world, across different times, is not to hope that they'll all come and join our side and uh, march with us in Western Europe or something, but to get off the plantation that has been set for us by our enemies and to show that the whole moral narrative, the whole framing that they've constructed their liberal multicultural society on that places us as the evil supremacist bad guys that want to go back to a time when it was us in the driver's seat of uh, merchant capitalism and colonialism to step off that plantation and to reject that paradigm. It's not about winning over people that hate us. It's about moralizing our own people and about bringing down the moral foundations that this system is founded on. So in conclusion, my nationalism, my vision of social nationalism is about this eternal, universal struggle of the qualitative versus the quantitative. It's about juxtaposing the sustainability of localism and social nationalism versus the unsustainable monstrosity of international finance capitalism. It's about recognising that nationalism today is the carrier of the true, the beautiful and the good against against the evil merchant class who see the entire planet as something that exists to be exploited for their enrichment. And to reject that, what to me is a moralizing, inspiring truth and endeavor, would be to surrender the fight before it's even begun.